This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good evening, everyone. I'm Miriam Babinski, Dean of the Emory Law School. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this evening's Martin Luther King lecture with our distinguished guest, uh, Professor Dorothy Roberts. Uh, I'm so glad to be able to uh, have with us tonight members of the law school community, uh, people from across the university and from the broader Atlanta community for this special event. We appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to continue your Martin Luther King uh, celebrations by spending time with us uh, this evening. And of course, I want to give a particular welcome uh, to our speaker, uh, Professor Dorothy Roberts. Uh, we were just in the little, I guess it's called a green room, although it's not green, uh, taking a few pictures. And I had a picture taken of me with Professor Roberts. Uh, and I exclaimed, I, you know, I'm so excited, because uh, my area of scholarship is health law. And one of the uh, scholars that I read early on in my career who influenced me so greatly uh, was Professor Roberts. And, I imagine myself sending this picture to all my health law colleagues. Uh, and so we're very honored uh, to have you here today. So uh, I think we are here at a law school, and there are many members of our law school community here, but people from, from across uh, in other disciplines and other focuses in life. So I think it's just an opportunity to highlight how in law schools every day we think about the relationship between law and justice. Uh, and whether or not uh, the foundations of our society which seem to be premised on the idea that law promotes justice uh, is an ideal that we are able to realize and what are the challenges for us in thinking about law and its relationship to justice. And so this annual lecture, the Martin Luther King uh, lecture, gives us an opportunity to actually think about that challenge, that question about the relationship between law and justice in light of Dr. King's life and work. Uh, and the inspiration that he provides, the constant challenge that he provides to all of us to think about how we in our own lives can work to make our society more just. Uh, and uh, as those of you who've seen the uh, promotional materials for this lecture saw, uh, Dr. King uh, had uh, worked so hard within his life uh, to fight the triple evils of poverty, racism, and, militar and militarism uh, through nonviolent uh, social change. Uh, and as he was thinking about those issues, about poverty and racism, he actually had um, uh, this view that injustice in healthcare might be one of the largest injustices our society faces. Uh, so in the broad scope of issues that he worked with and all of the challenges that we know that he confronted and that we confront, that justice in healthcare was something that we particularly needed to pay attention to, a particular form of injustice uh, that was very severe. So we are honored, as I said a moment ago, that Professor Dorothy Roberts is going to lead us in considering these themes of justice and healthcare. Uh, and I'll say a few more things about her beyond my own personal uh, admiration uh, to say uh, uh, that we're delighted to have her as a speaker uh, because she has, in fact, focused in her career on health, justice, and bioethics, uh, particularly as those uh, areas impact the lives of women, children, and African Americans. And she herself has stated that health inequities are structured by the intersection of poverty and racism and had that as an important aspect of her work. She's written several important books. I'll mention two, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Biz Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, uh, which was published in 2011, and Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, which was originally published in 1997, which had the 20th anniversary edition released in 2017, uh, which is a tribute to how vital and enduring her questions and her research are uh, for us as a society. As a society. Uh, Professor Roberts has published more than 100 articles and book chapters. She's the co-editor uh, of other major books on constitutional law, women in the law, and other topics. And as we were just talking about a few moments ago, her TED Talk on race-based medicine has been viewed more than 1.2 million times. Uh, and so I think for younger people in, in the audience, that may be more important than the books. <laughs> the debates, uh, back and forth. Uh, she's the founding director of the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society uh, and uh, the Center for Africana Studies. Uh, and she's received numerous uh, forms of recognition and awards, including uh, election to the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, and it is my great pleasure uh, to thank uh, Professor Roberts, to invite her to come forward, uh, and to allow us to hear her thoughts for us this evening. 
Thank you, Dean Bobinski, for that very gracious and warm and personalized uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on your deanship here. I've only heard wonderful, wonderful things of a appreciation from everyone I've met here. I want to give a special shout out to my twin, Dorothy Brown. Where are you, Dorothy? There she is. Uh, we jokingly call each other <laughs> twins. And uh, other friends I have here, I won't go on, but it's a great pleasure to be back at Embry Law School. So uh, as Dean Bobinski said, Dr. Martin Luther King did make health an important aspect of his campaign for justice. He connected it to his advocacy against poverty and militarism and racial inequality. And in fact, I'm going to start with the words that uh, Dean Bobinski mentioned. Uh, he very firmly did say, and he's often quoted as saying, that of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Now, I, when I did some research on this quote, I discovered that even though he's quoted this way, there are a couple errors in it. He actually said in 1966, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhuman. And I think it makes a difference because he wasn't just saying injustice in health care, but he was saying more broadly, injustice in health, which is beyond health care. It includes health care, but it's more than health care. And he not only said it's the most shocking and inhumane, in terms of the treatment of people, but it's inhuman. And I think by that he meant it's a reflection of how we treat people as human beings, whether this nation values everyone equally as a human being. And saying that injustice in health is the most shocking and inhuman is because inequalities in health reflect inequalities in valuing people as human beings. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Certainly, when he said that, he meant that the huge gaps in health between white people and people of color, especially black people in America, is shocking and a reflection of the devaluation of life. Uh, former Surgeon General David Satcher in 2005, in an article entitled, What If We Were Equal, said, imagine if every day a jumbo jet filled with 230 passengers, African American passengers, went up in the air and crashed, killing every single person on the plane. He said, that is how many black people in America died in that year because they had a lower life expectancy than white people. So we're talking about millions and millions of black Americans who have died prematurely because of inequities in health. He also was probably thinking about differences in outcomes from diseases like breast cancer. In Chicago, this study conducted around the same time as David Satcher's article found that although black women in Chicago have a lower incidence of breast cancer, they die at twice the rate of white women in Chicago. And that, that is hundreds of black women who are dying each year because they don't have the life expectancy or the survival rate from breast cancer that white women have. Okay, do you get the point, that this comparison? Now, one of the interesting things that these researchers found was that in 1980, the death rate from breast cancer between white women and black women was exactly the same. And over the course of 20 years, this gap emerged. And it didn't emerge because of something wrong with black women. 
And very often when researchers are trying to explain health inequities, the first thing they ask is, what's wrong with black people that makes them die so much, that makes them so sick? But this shows that it wasn't anything in black women's bodies that caused them to die more. It was that white women's survival rate doubled. Their death rate was cut in half over those two decades. And the researchers concluded that it had to be because of the advances in breast cancer detection and therapy that only white women had the advantage of. Uh, one of the researchers, Steve Whitman, who unfortunately passed away recently, uh, he's the man pictured here. I interviewed him about this and he said, white women got all the advantages of these advances in breast cancer detection and treatment and black women got not one iota of advantage from it. And now that's probably because in their segregated neighborhoods in Chicago, there isn't equal access to healthcare and also they have greater exposure to harmful living conditions that make it hard to survive breast cancer. Another example is the maternal mortality rate in the United States. Uh, shockingly and inhumanly, to use Dr. King's words, the maternal death rate in the United States is going up. There's no other developed nation in the world where the rate of death from pregnancy-related causes is going up. And even in most developing countries, the rate is going down. It might be higher than in the United States, although there are some developing countries where the rate is lower than in the United States. And to make it even worse, black women are suffering the brunt of this high death rate. They're three to four times more likely than white women to die from pregnancy-related causes. In some parts of the United States, not far from here, the Mississippi Delta, it's deadlier for a pregnant black woman to live than in Rwanda or Kenya. That's how abysmal the rates of death are from pregnancy and childbirth in the United States, especially for black women. Now, I think Dr. King was surely referring to these inhuman gaps in health, these mortal, lethal aspects of the inequalities of health in the United States. But I think he was also referring to something even more fundamental than that, which is the very concept of race and the way in which it paints black people as naturally prone to poorer health. And this goes to the very idea that race is a biological category that ranks human beings in a hierarchy of superiority and inferiority. Well, where did that come from? Uh, we know that this is an invented concept that we can trace its origins to, ironically, the Enlightenment period, uh, which, according to historian Terence Keel, a wonderful, uh, pretty new professor, uh, historian now at UCLA, uh, he has traced this idea to backward theological thinking uh, that claim that God created the races. And of course, people who were interpreting the Bible to say that God created the races always interpreted as God created man in white people's image, in his image, or I should say God created white people in God's image, okay. <laughs> and then everybody else was a poor reflection of that. Uh, and that idea was 
transported into scientific thinking in the 1700s, uh, almost whole cloth. But instead of saying God created the races and made white people superior and in the image of God, believing that white people were created first and everybody else was a diminution of white people, the Enlightenment scientists said, well, something in nature did it. So they left theological thinking behind because the Enlightenment was a period of reason, rationality, uh, but they imported into it this antiquated pre-modern notion that some force of nature divided all human beings into discrete, separable races. And they put those races into a hierarchy where white people were at the top and black people were at the bottom and other groups fell somewhere in between. And why did they do this? They did it to justify what Europeans were doing politically at the time, which was to go to other lands, conquer the people there, enslave them or exterminate them and extract their labor, extract their property. And it was very convenient to have a theory that said, this is just what nature demands. Nature caused this. It also fit into Enlightenment thinking about tolerance and equality, the philosophical, political aspects of the Enlightenment that went along with the science that a nation should be ruled by reason by tolerance, by liberty, by equality. But of course, they excluded the people they were enslaving from those concepts, right? So how does the Enlightenment do that? It does it by creating a concept of race that is supposedly biological and natural. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is the quintessential example of a racial scientist slash politician because he used this idea that nature created the races differently in order to justify excluding black people from his vision of a nation founded in liberty and equality. Again, it's not my political, what we would today call racism, that causes me to reach this conclusion. It's just my observation as a scientist of the differences that nature created. Then you can go to sleep at night and still say, right, I believe in equality and liberty, and yet I'm enslaving even my own children on my plantation. Uh, another aspect of the enshrining of race as a biological category in law, something I talk about in my book, Killing the Black Body, is the way in which lawmakers defined race. Uh, they, again, they did not discover it and just put into law what nature created, but they pretended that's what they were doing but they clearly were inventing it because they actually had to sit in the legislature and figure out what the definition of race should be and how to tell what race people are. So in the 1600s in Virginia, they were faced with this question. This is the preamble to a, one of the very first laws ever passed in the, in the colonies, whereas, there is doubt as to the status of children born to a Negro woman and fathered by an Englishman. We have to pass this law. Now, why, why were there doubts about it? And why were there even, why did this question come up? It came up because Englishmen, and remember there was no United States or America yet, they were still Englishmen who had come to settle the United States, or what's now the United States, the New World in Virginia, and they 
were sexually assaulting, they were raping enslaved African women. And those women were having children. And there's nothing in nature that tells you what race those children are. You have to invent it. And of course, they invented it according to what would be in their political best interests, not in their moral <laughs> obligation to their children, not even based on tradition that the father should be the one whose line is passed down. No, they decided that the children should have the status of the mother and be black, be Negro, as they said, so that they could enslave those children. And to this day, we think of any child born to a black woman is black. It doesn't matter what race the father is. And that evolved eventually, especially during the Jim Crow era, into the view that anyone with any African ancestry is black, but only people with pure European ancestry are white. Different rules. It's not in nature. If it was in nature, there'd be one rule, the natural rule, but it's a political rule that created race. Now, in addition to the invention of race as a biological category, there was a system of health care that was created for slavery. And that was a system that treated enslaved people for the benefit of their owners. They were kept in whatever health was needed to be workers. But it also meant they could be experimented on because they were chattel property. And one example of that is J. Marion Sims' ex gynecological experiments on enslaved women. Without their consent, that would have been meaningless to him. There's no such thing as an enslaved person consenting any more than the chairs you're sitting on were consenting to you sitting on them. They're just property. And of course, their bodies could be used for the benefit of white people. It also led to the racial concept of disease, which is the idea that people of different races have different diseases and experience common diseases differently. This is a very important concept in promoting the biological concept of race because it was proof that doctors could confirm that the races actually were biologically distinct. So the fact that races have different diseases proves, and still proves to many people today, that that's usually the first objection that I get when I say race is invented, the first objection. So if you were planning to come up and ask this question, I'm going to answer it now. <laughs> I have uh, predictive <laughs> skills. Uh, but that idea, you know, many people still today think, well, people of different races have different diseases, therefore race is biological, it's natural. And that, again, is a concept that was developed, especially in the United States during the slavery era. Uh, and it was always framed as not only do the black people have different diseases, but because of those diseases, they either are fit to be enslaved or they need, otherwise need the control of white people. And so Dr. Samuel Cartwright uh, was a doctor trained at University of Pennsylvania, where I hail from. And by the way, I just started a project called Pen Medicine and the Afterlives of Slavery, where I want to deal with this and address it in concrete ways in Philadelphia. But uh, he is one of the many people that came through Penn Medicine Medical School who had a theory 
well, I shouldn't say a theory, he claimed this was fact, that he observed these facts about the peculiar diseases of the Negro race. And his main idea was that black people had lower lung capacity and therefore had to be forced to work in order to be healthy. All right, so slavery was good for black people's health and they would have bad health if they weren't enslaved. Uh, drapetomania, the disease that causes Negroes to run away, was kind of an offshoot of that, that black people who ran away must be crazy because they didn't know what was good for them. They were running from what was beneficial to their health and so they had a mental disorder that he diagnosed. This idea that enslavement or control, supervision, surveillance is good for certain people's health, again, circulates to this day, to this day, but it is so powerful because it can take freedom and turn it into slavery and slavery into freedom. This was what Cartwright reported to the Louisiana Medical Association and was then printed in an article that he wrote in a medical journal. It is the red vital blood sent to the brain that liberates their mind when under the white man's control. And it is the want of sufficiency of red vital blood that chains their mind to ignorance and barbarism when in freedom. I just think this is one of the most powerful statements of racism that I have ever heard because it turns around as if it were logical that black people are free when enslaved. And the reason he could do it is because he was a doctor who supposedly, again, was not making this up. He was just observing nature. Now, for most of the U.S. history, black people were enslaved. And we had that system I mentioned of health care for enslaved people for the benefit of white owners. That's for most of U.S. history. And then for the next hundred years, from the end of slavery to the civil rights movement, there was a separate system of health care for black people and white people. Even in the North, Philadelphia and Chicago had separate hospitals for white people and black people. And in the South, that was Jim Crow law. And so there was the colored patient ward and the ward for white people. At least some of you have probably heard of Henrietta Lacks, who was treated in the colored patient ward at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Okay, I, I try not to go off, and just, but I, so I can't help myself. There's a, I have to tell you this story, and maybe someone will cut me off if I go too long. But I once gave a talk at Penn about uh, Henrietta Lacks, and there was an elderly white gentleman in the audience who right away wrote, raised his hand. He said, I actually practice at Johns Hopkins Hospital in the 50s. Uh, and the color patient ward, the patients there got better treatment than the patients in the white ward. So you're, I don't know what you're talking about. Henrietta Lacks got better treatment. And I said, well, how could that possibly be? And he said, because we conducted the experiments of advanced new tech, medical treatments in the colored patient ward, so they had the access to the most advanced treatments. But, you know, whenever anybody says that any institution created in the US is better for black people, I'm, I'm suspicious of it. <laughs> I'm suspicious of it. 
Now, you might say, oh, well, that was, uh, that ended with the civil rights movement. No, it did not. The idea that patients should be treated by race because race is a biological category and the reason why we have health gaps is because of innate biological differences is very popular. In fact, I'd say that's, that is the dominant view in medicine today. And let me just give you one example of it, and that is glomerular filtration rate. Uh, this is actually my daughter sent this to me, and I couldn't believe my eyes when I first saw it. Uh, this is a test for kidney function, and uh, doctors look at it to determine whether they should be concerned about the patient's kidney function. Uh, and you'll see that it routinely, this is common. This is actually from UCLA Medical Center. I mean, it's common in the, this is standard practice, that the reading comes out, the reading is different for African American patients and all other human beings. All right, now understand it's measuring a chemical in the blood. So whoever the individual patient is, it's one amount of this chemical. Okay, but if the patient is black, it means something different. Whoever this patient is, the patient's black, than any other human patient. How could that possibly be? How could that possibly be? I looked at it, I said, how could doctors practice medicine that way? But they do because they assume that black people, this is one of the explanations for it, have greater muscle mass than other people. You know, just like we supposedly have lower lung capacity than other people. And all sorts of other things that uh, are different about black people as a race, categorically, than all other human beings. Oh, by the way, I'm working with people to get rid of this, too. <laughs> okay, and it, there are, there's already two hospitals in the United States that have stopped doing this. I mean, two of, you know, lots and lots of hospitals, but it's a start, and it shows that it can be done. Because many people say, well, we can't treat black patients properly if we don't treat them differently than other human beings. And that's not true. So even it just two hospitals doing it proves it. Let me mention one other thing about this, because you might be thinking, well, maybe black people do have, maybe their lungs function differently, or maybe their muscle mass is different, and this is beneficial. You'll notice that the reading is, the estimate is better for black people, the black patient, than if the patient were of any other race. All right, but the higher, um, it's always a higher estimate, and that means their kidneys are functioning better, okay? This has disqualified black patients for kidney transplants that they would have gotten if they were white or any other, or Asian or Native American, because it looks as if their kidneys are normal. I mean, this is what, it, what this means is this is normal for a black person. Just in the same way that with a spirometer, which is still in use with some models having a button for race so that it changes the reading for black people. And this is based on the same idea that Samuel Cartwright had, that black people have lower lung capacity. So you breathe into the spirometer there's a, there's a reading, but it, for, if, for a black person, it could be considered normal. For anyone else, it's abnormal because it's based on the assumption that black people's lungs operate differently to begin with. Okay, again, you can see how this could have a damaging effect on a patient who has asthma, for example. The doctor says, well, that's normal. It's normal for you because you're black. The exact same 
amount of air in the lung for anybody else. They say, oh, we better get you special care. And this has operated against black people in asbestos litigation where experts come in and say, well, the damages are this much for the white worker in the asbestos plant, but it's less for the black worker because the black worker naturally had lower lung capacity. And I've also heard by, from a very reputable source that in the NFL concussion litigation, experts have testified that black people should get lower damages because our cognitive capacity starting out is lower than other people's. So the concussion didn't cause as much damage to the black person as it did to, you know, what's the guy's name? <laughs> I won't get personal. <laughs> we won't get into black and white quarterbacks right now. But <laughs> But, but I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I mean, it's, it's so, it's serious. It's like, it's, it should appall all of us. And I'm trying to point out that these corrections for race that are supposed to be so beneficial to us have real life deadly consequences. And I really challenge, I challenge any doctor who believes in this to, to show me that race correction has helped black people more than all the damage that has come from the biological concept of race and disease. Because I can show you centuries of harm that's come from it, and we still have appalling health gaps in the United States. We haven't changed much since the time of slavery. One example of the damage of race-based medicine and the assumption that black people's bodies function differently is the undertreatment of black people for pain. And it's long been known that black patients with the exact same injuries, painful injuries like long bone fractures, get less pain treatment than white patients. A study recently of black children with appendicitis diagnosed appendicitis in severe pain, showing that they are in severe pain, are far less likely to get opioid pain treatment than white children. Now just think about this. You know, you have a child screaming in pain with a diagnosed condition that the doctor knows is painful, and yet whether they consciously or unconsciously do it, Many doctors in the United States do not give that black child the pain treatment that they know would relieve the pain when they would give it, go to the next bed and give it to the white child. Now, this is probably based on the view that if you give a black child opioid pain tre treatment, the child's going to become a drug addict. Because, of course, black people are naturally predisposed to drug addiction. Whereas it's safe to give it to the white child. And I don't have time to go into it, but this, that thinking is definitely linked to the opioid crisis in the United States today because it led to the marketing of opioid painkillers to white patients explicitly and to the overprescription of these drugs to white patients. Uh, recently, there was a, a piece that uh, pointed this out and then foolishly said, well, this shows how black people were protected. No. I mean, it does show how white people can be harmed by racism, but black people haven't been protected by the undertreatment of pain. They've suffered from it. <laughs> it's interesting. I talked about the, this in my TED Talk. At the time, I speculated that it was because of stereotypes about black people, that black people don't experience pain as much as white people and are prone to drug addiction. Since I gave that talk, a study has come out documenting this. It was a study of students 
uh, medical students and residents at University of Virginia Medical School, asking them about their beliefs about racial differences, racial biological differences. And they found that a substantial number of medical students and residents, residents who are treating patients, in fact, you know, when I called up Penn Medicine the other day and said I, I need an appointment with, just for a physical, they said, well, we don't have any attending doctors available for like a year, uh, but you can see a resident. You know, residents treat, routinely treat patients. So they found that a substantial number of medical students and residents, and by the way, I, I don't think that doctors necessarily have fewer of these myths in their heads than residents do, uh, believed that there were these biological differences between blacks and whites. Beliefs like black people have thicker skin than white people. Black people have less sensitive nerve endings than white people. And they found that those beliefs predicted the undertreatment of pain by, uh, by the uh, residents. Now, there was great hope that with the mapping of the human genome and its revelations that race does not exist at the genetic level, that there would be some change in these practices and concepts. Uh, Bill Clinton said that it showed that in genetic terms, all human beings, regardless of race, are more than 99.9% .9 the same. Not the best way of saying it. He should have said that it showed that race does not exist at the genetic level at all, and that the 0.1% of genetic difference among human beings, which is a lot of difference, is not categorized by race. It cannot be grouped by race. But shortly after that, there was a resurgence of research looking for gene-based differences between races and tying those differences to health disparities. Nicholas Wade, uh, wrote in the New York Times only a year after that draft of the human genome was, map was revealed that this was the next phase of the human genome project to look for genetic differences between human races. Uh, I documented in my book, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, this resurgence in scientific journals and uh, reflecting research done and in the media of the idea that race is a genetic grouping. And I argued that the reason for the popularity of this idea was that it provides an explanation like Thomas Jefferson's explanation for why there continue to be these stark racial inequalities in health, but also in incarceration, in income, in wealth, in housing, in education, you know, in every aspect of well-being in the United States. We continue to have these stark differences in what at least a majority of justices on the US Supreme Court say is a colorblind society. So how do you explain a colorblind society that has all these inequities? Must be nature causing it, not racism. And I pointed out that biotech and pharmaceutical companies were taking up this idea to market, develop and market race-specific products. Uh, also, uh, after I wrote that book, uh, there was a study actually out of uh, Canadian University, Simon Fraser University, that documented this rise in the use of a biological race concept in articles, peer-reviewed articles about race and genetics. So the dark line, uh, they call racial realists, but 
that you know, I think they're actually racial unrealists because they actually believe race is a biological category, but that's the spike in articles that treated race as if it were a biological variable or biological category in, in uh, the articles versus those who treat it as a social construction which uh, remain pretty flat. We also see this idea in biomedical research that is trying to explain health inequities like uh, the higher rates of maternal death, higher infant mortality rates, uh, and in this case, higher rates of preterm birth, which is related to infant mortality, uh, with hypotheses like this, that black race, independent of other factors, increases the risk of preterm birth and its frequency of recurrence. Now, this isn't even a provable hypothesis, because you know, you'd have to control, right, for every social determinant that affects preterm birth, and they didn't even Get any, they just control for a few variables. They didn't even try to do a reasonable job of it. Uh, but also, what, what is the meaning of black race independent of other factors? You know, it's almost like there's an idea that there's some essence of blackness that circulates within black people. However, that's defined that causes all these problems in a way that is not postulated, as they use the word postulated, about other groups of people. You know, it's not only the idea that black people's bodies are prone to disease and other terrible things, but that the reason for that is based on some evolutionary principle that for some reason only operates in the case of black people. One, one thing that has come out of the whole opioid crisis that for me emphasizes this is the way that now, I have not seen a single study, media report, anything that has said anything about white people's natural propensity to drug addiction as an explanation of the opioid epidemic. It has been everything. People disagree about the, the uh, culture of despair and whether it's because of the closing of auto plants and coal mines, uh, or if it's because white people believe that their socioeconomic position and privilege, but it's all a social economic explanation. I have never seen anyone suggest any kind of natural predisposition that NIH should invest millions of dollars in testing white people for their genetic predisposition to drugs to explain it. I've, if anyone has seen it, please stop, because I've seen nothing about that. So why is it that when it comes to black people, it's something independent of social factors that must be causing all these problems? The, the very research design, the very theory behind the research is different for black people. It's, it's so deep. It's so deep. And it's not, it's not just that our bodies are different, but that, or that they function differently than other races. But the very principle of physiology is different. You see what I'm saying in black bodies? It's, it's deeper than just racial difference. I think this is what King was referring to when he said it's the most shocking and inhuman. It's inhuman. It's not just inhumane, it's inhuman. It's, it's treating black people as if we are not human beings like everyone else. We are a different kind of human being. And they suggested that this, you know, they had to say probable genetic component because they didn't have the research design or the findings that could have led to a conclusive finding, in which case the study should not have even been published but they still are allowed to speculate, even though they never proved it, that there's a genetic component that may underlie the public health problem presented by the racial disparity in preterm birth. 
why, why do this? Why say that when you have no proof of it? What is the value of that? And then the New York Times publishes a headline that says study points to genetics and disparities in preterm births. But it didn't do that. Why would the New York Times publish? What is this obsession with finding a genetic explanation when there's no evidence of it? In addition, the Food and Drug Administration approved for the first time a drug specifically labeled for a single race. This is a, Bidil is a therapy for heart failure that is approved for marketing to black patients specifically. Uh, the drug was developed without any regard to race, but to get a new patent, the cardiologist who did no genetic testing in relation to this drug, uh, claimed that it was a drug for black people conducted a clinical trial that only included black participants, and the FDA approved it as a drug for black patients. Why did they do that? What's the explanation? The advisor, uh, the, the chair of the FDA advisory committee that recommended this type of uh, labeling said, again, without any Foundation whatsoever, we're using self-identified race as a surrogate for genetic markers. Unknown genetic markers, but just the assumption that black people's heart failure, hearts, blood vessels, response to drugs is different from all other human beings because of some innate difference in our bodies. And the FDA claimed that this was a step toward the promise of personalized medicine. I would say it's a step away from it because you're treating people categorically by race instead of being personalized. Now, from the beginning, there has been resistance against this view that the reason for black people's position, disadvantaged position, whether we're talking about health, education, wealth, income, other kinds of status, is because of our innate predispositions. And W.E.B. Du Bois was the first academic to challenge this view. He challenged it at a time when the dominant view was that black people were so sick because they could not adapt to freedom. Because again, the dominant view during the enslavement of Africans was that slavery was good for their health. So the corollary view after emancipation was that black people were sick because they were emancipated. And Du Bois argued that no, black people's poor health is because of the inferior social conditions that they are forced to live under in the United States. Uh, he pointed out, kind of comically, I think, that the Irish received similar treatment and assumptions about their innate predispositions when he says, kind of diplomatically, they were unpopular. In other words, when they were considered to be racially distinct from the English. I think Dr. King would be very gratified that there is a growing movement to study how structural racism affects health. And this body of research connects structural disadvantages like poverty and segregation, housing segregation, to the unequal health conditions of people in the United States. Uh, there's a burgeoning, exciting body of research that looks at the ways in which racism is embodied. Uh, just one example that I kind of like is this study that compared 
heart attacks, the rate of heart attacks among black people in states that have high levels of structural racism, which they defined in the study, uh, than states with low levels of structural racism. Uh, this just gives you a taste of this different approach to understanding racial inequalities in health. There are lots of other ways of studying it as well. But to put it succinctly, a uh, headline of an op-ed piece I prefer to the others, we're sick of racism, literally. In Fatal Invention, I captured it this way, race is not a biological category that naturally produces health disparities because of genetic differences. Race is a political category that does have staggering biological consequences because of the impact of social inequality on people's health. Now, I, I want to caution, though, that some of the research that is looking at how racism gets embodied, how social disadvantage has a physical effect on people's bodies, sometimes loses sight of the structural inequalities that need to be dismantled in order to improve health and instead focus on what biological interventions or other kinds of interventions can be made on the bodies of the people who are affected by racism. And that is something we have to be very vigilant about because it can take research that starts out with a great premise, the premise that social disadvantage causes these, inequ these inequalities in health, biological inequalities. It's not that biology causes social inequality. Okay, so it starts from a better position, but if you don't keep your eye, your focus on the structural inequality, another way of saying it, if you don't have legal scholars and sociologists and <laughs> other social scientists on the research team, and you just have biologists, they tend to focus on what they can do in the lab. I think their work is really important in illuminating these path biological pathways. But if you're just focused in on the lab and you don't really understand the structures that caused it, and your objective is to come out with a biological remedy, it can be just as damaging as this old biosocial science that blamed genes and heredity for the unhealthy outcomes. I think what researchers need to understand is that racism is not the product of race. Race is the product of racism. In other words, it's not that race is a biological category that divides us, that can be studied as a biological phenomenon, and as long as you're not racist, it's okay to do that. It's important to understand that race was invented in order to promote racism. Racism requires this biological concept of race. And so we have to challenge the notion that race is a biological category as we do anti-racist work. A year before he was assassinated, Dr. King spoke on this very idea about the role of science in promoting or blocking racial justice and or injustice. And he said, when we look at modern man, we have to face the fact that modern man suffers from a kind of poverty of the spirit which stands in glaring contrast with a scientific and technological abundance. We've learned to fly the air as birds. We've learned to swim the seas as fish. 
yet we haven't learned to walk the earth as brothers and sisters. And I think King didn't mean to say there's something innately wrong with modern science. He wasn't opposing science or scientific innovation, but he was saying it's immoral to have science that ends up with advances that only certain groups of people have access to on the basis of race or how much money they have. He wasn't opposing science, he was opposing the idea of a science that promotes racism and concepts of innate inequality among human beings. He was calling for us to have a science that centers social justice, something that some people think is inimical to science. Now they'll say, well, no, then you're being ideological. You're not being scientific. But I think, as I've shown from the very beginning in this talk, science has always been ideological. I think as, as King was recognizing, the question is, your science going to be in support of justice? Or is it going to be in support of injustice? And I would call upon all of you, as Dr. King did, to affirm our common humanity by working to end the divisions that are caused by social inequality. And I'll end there. And I'm happy to take any questions and comments. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks very much. Um, you uh, graciously agreed to take questions, and we do have uh, microphones at the back of the room. Hi. Hello. Um, I'm Sophia. First of all, thank you for your wonderful talk. I'm a first-year medical student here at Emory, <laughs> yeah. um, and I wanted to get your thoughts on something. Sure. So each time we're introduced to a new disease, a lot of times they'll offer the prevalences. So. Yes in gender and race in all different categories, but yes. like kind of the prototypical examples are sickle cells more prevalent in black people. Cystic right. fibrosis is more prevalent in white people. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, I feel like in terms of using this information in a, in a differential diagnosis, mm -hmm. I think the argument for it is saying, use this information to get to the correct diagnosis faster, get the person healthier faster. Yeah. But the, the flip side is then you miss the rare black person who has cystic fibrosis. Right, yeah. But it and and it delays you from getting to the correct diagnosis. It might prevent you from getting to it altogether. So I was just wondering what your thoughts on that are and sort of how to balance using yeah. this information. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, these genetic diseases, cystic fibrosis and sickle cell. I bet you that you're told the prevalence of common diseases as well. Different cancers, uh, different uh, cardiovascular diseases. So it's not just those diseases that are clearly linked to one genetic mutation. Uh, medical students are taught about the different prevalences of disease across the board. OK, so I just want to make the point that uh, we could focus on cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia, but it's much bigger. The race-based medicine is far beyond those relatively rare examples. You know, most people who suffer from disease suffer from common diseases, which involve complexities of genetics and environment that researchers and doctors don't even fully comprehend. And yet, medical students are taught, even in those cases, that there is some distinction between people of different races. 
And I, they're not only taught the prevalence, there is the implication, if not the direct teaching, that it's because of something innate in people of different races. So uh, yes, breast cancer, black, as I showed you, black, black women die at higher rates, not only in Chicago, but all over the United States from breast cancer. OK, what does that mean? Uh, as I pointed out, it most likely means that it has something to do with structural racism, not with innate differences. And so the first thing I think that it's important for medical students to do is to think about why am I being taught about these differences? What do they mean? Do they mean that every time I see a black patient, I should think that that patient's body operates differently than patients of other races? Or that, you know, I've been focusing mostly on the black-white divide, but there are also, and I, and I would say that most of the, at least disproportion, a disproportionate number of folkloric ideas about peculiar bodies focus on black people. Uh, and there is definitely an idea within science that is completely unscientific that white bodies and black bodies are the most different from each other. There's absolutely no reason scientifically to think that. But that, that's clearly a political ideology that's been imported into medicine and science. So that's one of the reasons why I focus on that distinction. Uh, but so, so the first thing is to, is to really question whether all of these racial distinctions you're being taught stem from some innate difference or if they stem from structural causes. I, that makes a big difference. Then the next thing I think it's important to ask is, well, what, why am I using race here? As you pointed out, some of it has to do with the little amount of time that doctors have to figure out what's wrong with the patient. Uh, and so race is often used as a proxy for something else. Just like in glomerular filtration rate, uh, there's a controversy about you know, exactly why black people are treated differently in terms of kidney function, but a common answer is it has to do with muscle mass. Well, then you're using race as a proxy for muscle mass. It would make more sense to determine the muscle mass of the patient than use race categorically for all patients. And that's true for lots of other things as well. So, Really, the best medicine would be to ask, what, why am I using race? What's it a proxy for? Let me get to the better indicator that's really going to help me treat the patient. And I know you say, well, I can get, you know, you're taught I can get to it faster by using race. But no, you get to it faster if you use the better indicator. And there's so many areas where family history the weight of the patient, the height of the patient, the diet of the patient, you know, so many things would be better indicators than using race. So that's, that's an, another, uh, another response I have. And that would be true for the vast majority of problems that patients have, health problems. Now, even when we talk about the very narrow category of gene-based diseases like um, cystic fibrosis and sickle cell, the risk of misdiagnosis could be seen as outweighing the advantage of using race. When, when it comes to sickle cell disease, I, I, again, as I said with uh, the I made the point that if we take all the harms that have been caused by this way of thinking and measure it against the advantages, I, I would wager that the harms are greater. And when I think about sickle cell 
and all the harms that have been caused to black people with the disease because they're black, because it's seen as a black disease. The fact that so much more money has gone into cystic fibrosis research than sickle cell research. The fact that many, many black patients in pain from the disease report that they are refused treatment because they're seen as drug seekers. The fact that there have been government policies that have discriminated against black people uh, because they're seen as potential carriers of the sickle cell trait. There's so many harms that come from thinking of it as a black disease as opposed to a blood disease that some people have. That, in fact, there, there's a study by Jay Kaufman and Richard Cooper that points out it would, it would actually be more cost effective and life saving to just, when you see something that looks like sickle, just test the person to see if they have sickle cell. Or, t or it could be a test that all babies have to determine if they have uh, the, the, you know, the two, um, the, the double mutation. So uh, there, there's so many ways around this categorical race-based approach to medicine that would free us to practice medicine better. See, to me, race-based medicine is an impediment to good medicine because it, doctors rely on it instead of figuring out better ways to treat disease and they rely on, a, on it also, and, and this affects policy in general, instead of looking at the structural causes of gaps in health. So all the money that's spent into looking into what's innately wrong with black people's bodies to explain gap, these horrible gaps in health, is money diverted and attention diverted from actually just addressing what we already know is what's causing it. I mean, we already know so much about why black people's health is poorer than white people's health in America. And yet, attention is diverted away from that by the message that, oh, it's because of their genes and there's nothing we can do about it. So I really encourage medical students to challenge this race-based education, uh, to form groups uh, at Penn, at Brown. There are groups of medical students who've gone through the curriculum and pointed out all the places where race-based medicine is being taught and advocated for taking it out of the curriculum. And that would free us to think about better ways of treating patients. Uh, as in the case of GFR, where once the, they got together, doctors, students, lab technicians got together and said, we are going to stop correcting for race in the eGFR. And they figured out how to do it. And that allows us to say, is there a better way to measure it than this ridiculous, crude, just multiply it by this factor if the patient's black. Like that, that is so backward and crude. How could that be precision medicine? It's, it's absurd. There are better ways to do it, but because it's race has just been seen as, oh, that's the way we'll do it, researchers haven't been looking into it. So now at Penn, we've got a group of physician researchers who are doing the work to figure out a better EGFR procedure. So anyway, <laughs> there's some ideas about how to, also, how to address it. Yeah. I want to say huge fan. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you again for being here. <laughs> Thanks. And a structural competency. Al, if you haven't come across that, Google it, read everything about structural competency. So this would be the last question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll try. I went on and on. Okay.
Thank you very much. Um, I was interested in hearing a little bit more about um, the intersectionality of environmental impacts, particularly environmental injustice impacts yes. for brown and black communities who are on the front line of climate change and also have historical generational impacts from high exposure to pollutants and kind of how within the law sphere, since this is a law school, law students could become advocates. Yes. Yes, that's a good point. I've kind of referred to it a little bit, but I didn't really have a chance to go into it. Uh, and you've already, just your question suggests so much fruitful ground for investigating this. Uh, we know that uh, part of the reason why black children have more severe asthma and are more likely to die from asthma than other children in the United States is because of their exposure to high, you know, highway fumes. For example, there was a great study that showed that children in the Bronx, black children in the Bronx, are exposed to far higher levels of toxins from all the highways crisscrossing there than children in other neighborhoods in New York City uh, that have lower <laughs> rates of severe asthma. So, um, that's just one example. Studies have shown how black neighborhoods are closer to uh, toxic waste sites. Um, there's uh, lead is another example. Studies showing that not only in Flint, Michigan, but in Chicago and other big cities, black children are more likely to be exposed to lead than other children in the cities. Uh, so there, there's a mound of evidence already that a uh, significant reason for health disparities in the United States is because of exposure to environmental toxins of all sorts. And so uh, definitely the health justice movement, reproductive justice movement, and environmental justice movement have uh, very important ways that they can work together to address these deadly exposures in the United States. Uh, you also mentioned climate change, and we also know that the people who are going to suffer most from the extreme forms of weather, uh, whether we're talking about heat in California, uh, or we're talking about flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, people who are most disadvantaged and again at risk of death from uh, these changes in climate, these extreme changes in climate, are low-income people of color. And so uh, whether it's toxins or weather, uh, and there are other forms of environmental assaults that people of color are especially, uh, especially exposed to that have a direct relationship to health inequities. And so I'm glad you raised it. It's, it's very important to see how these movements are connected and to work together to challenge, again, not just now the intervention, uh, in people who are already exposed. And of course, having access, equal access to healthcare is important for that. But how do we end the unequal structures that created that as well? You know, I mentioned the, my concern about biological interventions without looking at the structural forces. I've already seen with Flint, Michigan, and black children exposed to lead, which we know is damaging to the brain. And there was just a, a headline in the New York Times recently about damaged children entering schools and children who are being suspended from school because of lead and because of the impact of lead uh, on their bodies. And you can see already that instead of focusing on the lead and getting rid of that, they still don't have clean water in Flint, Michigan. Okay, so instead of cleaning up the water, instead of giving reparations to the people who are harmed by it, there's a focus on the danger of these children who have been damaged by it, the threat to 
the school system by these damaged children. And it's so easily we slip from what should be our focus on the structural injustice that should be dismantled and abolished to the defective children that are a result of it. And so that's something that I think an environmental justice movement that's focused on justice instead of being just focused on the biological pathways of inequality uh, can, can be very influential. Thanks for your question. Yes, uh, thanks very much uh, to everyone for being here, for the questions that we've had, for the beginning of a discussion which actually can continue uh, as we have a uh, space for a we don't, And we don't have time for one more question. Uh, we could have time for one more question. <laughs> I don't I apologize. know, I, I just feel like... I apologize, I didn't see you. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Bar Hi, Barbara. Hi, Barbara, good to see you. Good, thanks. Uh, I was thinking that with my students where I'm teaching about children and child development, one of the strongest pieces of um, information that I give them through, you know, the, comes from the uh, Harvard Center on the Developing Child. Yeah. Where uh, there's a very effective uh, video of a doctor discussing how racism, mm -hmm. racism itself, Mm -hmm. Augment stress and stress yes. has direct impact yes. on health. Yes. So we you know a direct connection there. And I yes. uh, I would uh, the, the whole ACEs experiment that I think had a lot to do with the CDC here. Yes. That I think is another important piece. Yes. Talk about it. Yeah, that's very true. So when I, I mentioned uh, the whole new body of research that is looking at how racism gets embodied. And I pointed to one study, and I mentioned there's lots of way, other kinds of studies that are looking at it. And one is what Professor Woodhouse has mentioned, which is studies looking at the impact of experiencing racism on the body and the ways in which it produces chronic stress, a chronic stress that is harmful to health. Stress is, is being seen now as one of the major ways um, that people become unhealthy, major unhealthy impacts on the body. And so the connection between racism and th some researchers are using biomarkers to show that the experience of racism itself has this impact on, the, on stress, which has an impact on all sorts of uh, bodily functions. Uh, there was just a study that came out maybe two or three days ago uh, that asked about 100 uh, adolescent, black adolescents and teenagers about their experiences of racism. And they experienced racism every single day in multiple ways, whether it was on TV, on social media, in going in a store and being followed people taunting them in school, hearing racial slurs in other ways, uh, just multiple ways in which young black people experience racism. And then there are other studies that have shown that those kinds of experiences have a direct impact on the body that produces long-term inferior health outcomes. Uh, and so that research is, is really important. Again, what's important is to end <laughs> those experiences, uh, even though it's great to have the right kind of care for the consequences of it, but the ultimate, the most important aspect of our response should be to end the racism that is causing the stress in the first place. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. Well, with, with that uh, additional thanks, uh, just a reminder, there's a reception outside. We invite you to continue the conversation about these important topics. And thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs>